So today I want to introduce to you Alexis Marin. She's a drama therapist. Her title is The Efficacy of Drama Therapy for Clients with Sex and Love Addiction. Uh, I'm Douglas Evans. For any of you who have not met me before, I'm the executive director here. And along with uh, Alex Katahakis, we started Center for Healthy Sex to offer a whole range of sex therapy, uh, psychotherapy work for couples, men, women, as well as sex and love addiction treatment work, which is, uh, really spans a whole spectrum of, of work that we do here. We offer groups, individuals, individual therapy, and couple work. Um, and we're really pleased to have you here. And welcome back to those of you who are returning. I know a lot of you have uh, continued to come back, and uh, we appreciate your participation. So I'm sure you're going to learn a lot today. And welcome, Alexis. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here with you today. So thank you so much for coming to witness what I have to say. It's very important. I don't know what's been going on recently, but something's happening within the therapy community where drama therapy is starting to get a little more spotlight. I don't know what's going on, but I've had the privilege of having a couple of people reach out to me personally to come and sit with them and explain to them what drama therapy is. And so maybe some of you wouldn't know what drama therapy is. Maybe some of you don't. Raise your hand if you know anything about drama therapy. Okay, so the majority of you, fantastic. For those of you that don't know what drama therapy is, shout out some things what you think it is. What do you Improv. Improv, yes, that's partially what drama therapy is. What else, what else do you think it is? Reenactment. Reenactment, that's perfect, that's part of it as well. Any, anybody else have any ideas? Uh, resolve of historical issues perhaps that have been unresolved as of the moment. I love you, perfection, thank you, <laughs> wonderful answer. Anybody else, what else do you think it is? Yeah. Or Playing the other person's role, maybe switching roles. Reversing roles, fantastic. Embodying a role, uh huh. Anything else? Anybody think it was therapy solely for actors? <laughs> no? Okay. So when I ask, when I say to people, hey, I'm a drama therapist, they go, oh, therapy for actors, huh? And even though I say yes, they probably need it more than anybody else, it's not solely for actors. So um, what my goal is for you guys today is to hopefully teach you a few techniques that you can infuse into your own practices, even if you're not a drama therapist. Very basic things that you can use to spice up your groups, spice up your individual sessions, just for yourself too, to have more of a breadth of how therapy can be really interactive and putting your mind into action. As you may have noticed, we have a little bit of an issue with our slides, so I have to do it from my computer, so I may, you may sleep every once in a while. Don't <laughs> freak out. We, we got it. All right? So. Let's get going. So first I wanted to share with you uh, my personal philosophy of how I work with my clients. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was first starting out is for me to come up with my own personal mantra. What do I want to give my clients? What's important to me to give to my clients every time I meet with them? So what I came up with is I believe in meeting my clients with grace and leaving them with the truth. That's my goal. So that's how I work with my clients. Whatever that means to you, I will let you interpret that, but I just wanted to let you know that's how I think about each session. The truth being their version of the truth, whatever feels the most raw and whatever feels the most basic you can feel it in their moral compass, their core self, which is something we'll get to later. Um, before I start telling you what exactly is drama therapy, I have a very important question. I need everybody to be very honest. Who has seen the movie Inside Out? Just three of you. Oh my goodness, really? Yes. Awesome. Okay, for those of you that haven't seen Inside Out, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Movie Inside Out. Okay, so I want to introduce a few friends to you. This is drama therapy in action. The whole movie is drama therapy, basically. So when I found out that I was going to do this lecture, I was full of joy. joy. I was so excited. I couldn't wait. I had so much to say, and I was thinking about my lecture and what I was going to do. And this little character inside my brain, she had the control. She's like, you can do this. You have so much to say, Alexis. <laughs> then something happened, which I'm sure you've all experienced if you're in the field. And my little inner critic and my um, you're a fraud voice came out. And this guy, what's this guy? Fear. Yeah. This guy started talking. You're not good enough. You're not going to be able to do it. You're going to forget what you're talking about. They're not going to understand. So fear got on the realm, and I was just shaking in my boots. I can't do this. All right. And then all of a sudden, after fear got his jollies out, he said what he needed to say. This other character took the helm in my brain, and she is. What does she look like? Ugh. Yeah. Alexis, <laughs> seriously? Don't worry, you'll be fine. Like, don't be afraid anymore, okay? So she took over and she kind of got me out of that little, you're afraid, you can't do that place. That's disgust. 
after disgust, I got a little sad. I felt badly that I had let myself go to fear and to disgust. And so, poor little, poor little sadness. She's so cute, isn't she? It's really easy to stay in sadness because she's just so squishy and so cute and you want to stay like this. And the problem with sadness is she needs to be dragged around. She's not really in control of her life. And so sadness took over and I felt like I was just being dragged around by the heel. And then, lastly, what I needed to get me out of the sadness was a little of this guy right here. What's he look like? Anger. 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 I found the fire in my soul. I said, you know what? You can do this. Dang it. You don't have to feel sad. You don't have to feel mad. You don't have to feel fear. You don't have to feel disgust. But let's do this. Let's pull it together and let's find the fire. And so finally, on my drive back up here today, all the way in the car for two hours, I was a little mad after because of the traffic. But joy came back into my life and I found her and I'm so joyous to be here. Okay? So these puppets or these dolls are absolutely adorable and such an amazing tool because whether it's the story that's infusing which puppet the little kid or your client picks up or whether it's you saying pick up this puppet and show me joy either way it gives them something to hold on to as like a distancing technique which is something that we'll talk about later but all of your homework whether you hear anything else that I say is go see inside out it's amazing all right all right so what is drama therapy? Drama therapy, by definition, is the practice of using dramatic principles for therapeutic purposes. Okay, that sounds kind of stodgy. It's not that stodgy. Um, basically, anything that you would use in an acting class, I may use in a session, a group session or a private session. So as you said, improvisation, role play, reversing roles, um, masks, makeup, and puppets, um, a whole bunch of all those different things are these dramatic principles that we'll use for therapy. Now the therapy part comes in and that it's much more personal, obviously. I'm not having my clients all the time speak as a character. We're using their personal stories, their reflections, and as the therapist I'm providing and promoting processing skills for the client. Now where it came from, well drama therapy has been around for as long as time, but we put a title on it or a label on it in the early 1970s some of the pioneers of drama therapy, um, Dr. Robert Landy, he's the one that sort of came up with the whole role theory idea. We have Renee Amuna, she works up in San Francisco at CIIS. We have David Reed Johnson, he's over there in New York as well. He does a lot of trauma work with people. Um, all of these people are, uh, I will mention again later on, but those are our pioneers of drama therapy. Um, as a drama therapist, good morning. Good morning. How are you? No problem. As a drama therapist, you have to be comfortable physically interacting with your clients. That's why the title of my book is going to be, It's Time to Get Off the Couch. You've got to get up. You've got to move around with your clients. You have to be um, comfortable embodying your own emotions, embodying their emotions, role-playing, interacting. Uh, moving with the client is a very important part of therapy. All right, So it's very, very kinetic. So like we keep saying, it's putting your mind into action. It's very fluid. <clears throat> It involves action activity based sessions, but also encourages the client to process on his or her own time. So a session, sometimes, depending on who it is and how well I know this client, may be completely activity based. It may be just a poem that we work on that day. And I'll give them a few tools and skills and things to think about, and they take that work home and they process themselves. And then they come back the next time. We add that processing onto the next layer of what that activity might be. Okay? So there is a lot of processing that happens alone for the client. All right. Next, uh, by focusing on their bodily experience of emotions, clients feel a sense of control over what they are feeling, which brings them into a major state of being present, of awareness, self-realization, and that catharsis which ultimately we are looking for, right? Okay, any questions on what drama therapy is so far? Doing good? Okay. And next, sex addiction and drama therapy, how does it work? So. The title of this is The Efficacy of Drama Therapy with Love and Sex Addiction, so I sort of wanted to bring it around so you could see how it works. So, working with clients with love and sex addictions, I look for the personal subtext, just like I was taught to do when I was first learning how to analyze a script. I have an acting background, all right? So when I would look at a script and I would look at a character, I would try to figure out what is that character's intention? That sounds so easy, right? So simple. That's what we used to do when we looked at a script. And so as a client is talking to me about what's going on in their story or their life, I try to figure out, good morning. 
what is it that that person needs to say? What do they need to hear? What's the strongest intention in their story or in that scene maybe in their life that they're thinking about? I listen for something along the lines of a relationship being unresolved, like you were saying back there, or a specific moment in time feeling as though it's been left hanging. I'm sure if you take a second to think about your own lives, you can all think about a moment in your past that just feels, eh, I don't know what happened. I didn't get to say what I needed to say to resolve that moment. This kid pushed me down in the playground when I was five, and I went and cried, as opposed to saying, hey, you suck, or that hurts my feelings, or standing up for myself. Maybe that started a pattern in your life where you get pushed around, okay? Maybe that's that unresolved hanging moment. We can go all the way back to your first memory, or it could be to yesterday when your boyfriend dumped you and you didn't get to tell him how you felt about it, okay? Those moments are big and we hold on to those things. Do you need a chair? You can go ahead and turn that one around and, yeah. All right? Um, so in that, I'm still looking for the intention behind a phrase. So somebody says, my boyfriend broke up with me yesterday, I'm incredibly sad. It's like, okay, well, what do you need to say to him beyond your sad? What do you need to hear to make you know that that moment's close, that you can let that go, you can let that relationship go? What do you need? When we have these moments in our lives, like not getting a last goodbye, that is something that I hear countlessly. Somebody passes away, and I didn't get to say the last goodbye, okay? We hold on to that forever, unless we get to do that, unless we get to start that grieving process to say goodbye. The end of a relationship through either death or breaking up or divorce, those are all, those are all grief cycles, right? And we have to learn how to start that first goodbye. Um, never having had the chance to ask forgiveness, that's a huge one too that I hear a lot. So these open wounds that take more than just talking about, it takes sort of reliving them, putting them on their feet, and that's where the closure comes. Uh, requires facing them head on. Clients can then stop turning to drugs, alcohol, sex, and love as a band-aid for those gaping wounds. And so what I offer to my clients as they're talking is I say, you know what, as I'm listening to you, this personal subtext, perhaps you need to hear, I still love you from your mother. Perhaps you need to hear, I'll never forget you from your sister. Perhaps you need to hear, you've been on my mind from your lover, whatever it is, okay? But more importantly, perhaps this is what you need to say to clean up your side of the street. You may never get to hear what you want to hear from that other person. In the play space of drama therapy, you can. Out in the real world, you may not. But you have control over what you say. So what do you need to say to forgive yourself and clean up what your part of the responsibility in this, real with this relationship is? Any questions there? Drama therapy techniques used for clients with love and sex addictions. All right, so this is a list of just a few things we can do with clients with love and sex addictions, really any type of addiction, and it just um, I change the lens through which I look at it, what they're looking at, shame or anger or what the different personal stories are. Uh, the first one, masks, makeup, puppets, different projective techniques. I'll go more into those a little bit, but... I kind of started with that. So anytime you can put something in your hand, like a puppet or a doll, you're distancing yourself from your emotion, actually physically, and mentally <coughs> distancing yourself. So those are projective techniques, and um, I'll talk about those in a little bit. Poetry and song and sand play. Three different things. Poetry, I'm actually going to have you do a little poetry with me today. Song, just movement to song. Everybody loosens up when you hear some songs, so that's really good. And sand play, I'm going to talk about. Um, I wish I had brought my sandbox with me, but I have something called kinetic sand. Has anybody heard of kinetic sand? <laughs> Brilliant. Oh my goodness. We'll go over that in a little bit too, but that's fantastic. Roll method and theory. Roll cards tell a story. Roll counter roll guide. Uh, that is Dr. Robert Landy's theory, which we'll go in depth to. Psychodrama. Who's heard of psychodrama? Yeah, okay, so obviously psychodrama falls under the drama therapy umbrella, really stands alone as its own incredible technique, right? And you can get training for that for years. Um, rehearsal for life, so I'll go into that a little bit as well. Spectrogram is something that I'm going to have you guys do here today as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the space to be able to put it in our bodies, but I'll give you a succinct sitting in your chair version. Um, <laughs> embodying emotions, roles, and concepts. Uh, that's kind of what I did here, too. If I embody emotion, I can really try to um, emanate what this guy looks like. Uh -uh, be really angry. Uh, befriending the addiction. That addiction spelled incorrectly. Don't look at that. Um, <laughs> mistake. Um, we are going to go through that as well. Ross Aesthetics. Um, I'll explain it a little bit. Ross Aesthetics. 
um, has the whole concept of basically fake it till you make it. So what I do with my clients there who have a really hard time putting any type of emotion in their body, I tell them, you act the crap out of that emotion then. Whatever you think anger looks like. It's okay if you don't actually feel angry. What does anger look like? And they generally do some large melodramatic vaudeville or ah, anger version, right? So how it actually works is there are, it's called rasa boxes. So I have all of these words, disgust, wonder, there's nine of them, uh, fear and shame. I put them on the ground in sort of a box matrix and I have them walk these emotions, okay? You are standing in wonder. Show me wonder. Dial it up. Show me wonder at 10. Show me wonder at 1. Show me at 5, okay? So I use them like a scale. I dial them up like volume. And in that, they kind of get out of their heads for a second. They feel really stupid at the beginning. And then we get over it. And then we're just playing with it, right? Sometimes the reason we have uh, two on here, fear and shame. Now, those are interesting how they're put together. But these are actually translated from Sanskrit, the original words. And the original words of Sanskrit did not have a perfect translations to either word. So for their word, the best way to describe it was fear and shame put together. So at my client, I can say, show me fear and shame put together and do you ever feel both simultaneously? Or I have them choose one and tell me a story as to when they used to, when they felt fearful, when they felt full of shame, okay? So that's the Ross aesthetics, Ross the boxes thing. Um, I can answer many more questions for you on that later on. Hip hop therapy, exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Using hip hop, to get kids and adults to talk to me in their language. Show me a sculpture of freedom. All right, move to it. Show me freedom with a hip hop beat. Great, now high five somebody and you're moving and you're acting together and you're creating group sculptures and there's always a beat going underneath it and then it basically turns into a rap. Okay, so I have a very specific group that I would use that with. It's not for everybody, but it is the whole concept of t t talk to me in my language, please, okay? All right, and lastly, bibliotherapy, which is basically um, if you have a client that has any sort of knowledge with the Bible or classic Bible stories and iconic roles in the Bible, you have them see how you relate to those people, how you relate to their stories, how that relates to your life and how you are sort of dictating your life through these classic um, Bible characters. All right, many, many more, as we said, growing practice, and here I'll tell you how they work with everybody. So we were just talking about those masks and makeup and puppets. So um, how many of you have heard the term aesthetic distance before? Have you ever heard that? No? <laughs> have you? I've Maybe you've forgotten it. Okay. So uh, with mask, makeup, and puppet, what we are looking for is creating an aesthetic distance for our client between themselves and their emotions. All right. If we have a client that is under distanced, it means that they are so overly connected to their emotions that they can't tell you a story without going to bawling, to getting so angry that they can't even get it out, to what, going through so much grief that they are just falling apart every time they relive that story. That's under distance, too close, okay? Over distanced is when we have a client that can only speak analytically. How do you feel? I think that I should be doing better. Really? <laughs> what does that feel like? I think, or well, I feel sad. Do you? Because you're smiling. That doesn't seem like you feel sad, okay? So they're so over distance that there's just no connection to their body and what they're actually feeling. So what we want to look for is that aesthetic distance where we get them somewhere in the middle. So if I have somebody that's under distanced, that, let's think of my arm like a ruler. I have one inch right here and 12 inches over here. So if somebody's under distance, all their emotions are right here in the one inch mark, okay? I wanna get them out here towards my elbow. So I'm gonna actually give them something to put into their hands to tell me about how they feel. A puppet, a doll, some maybe a life-size doll. So they project all their emotions out because they're too close as it is. So let's project it out and let's see your emotions like from a third person point of view. Let's put them out there, okay? So like all the way out there at 12 inches. They can have some control over that as opposed to when they're so under distance that it's so close they can't even see them. For the person that is over distanced, already living out there on that 12 inch mark, I want to bring them much closer to their emotions. So I'm going to have them use a mask because that's right up close and personal. Or I'm going to have them even go to makeup where they draw on themselves. Can you think of anything more intimate than drawing on your face? or having somebody else draw on your face. How often do you have somebody else that you don't know touch your face? 
it's creepy when somebody you don't know touches your face, right? That would be the first time to recoil. Everything else, we kind of touch on each other often, shake a hand, give a hug, but man, there's something so intimate about touching a person's face. So if I wanna get them real close to their emotions, touch that or have them draw on themselves, all right? Um, Long story short, once we do that with the clients, then we're looking for that place in the middle where they can talk about a memory, have the emotion, and not break down every single time. All right? Um, the song and the poetry, that's about creating and recognizing oneself. Rebuilding oneself after shame recovery takes unearthing the positives, all right? So with a lot of the poetry that I do, it's really focusing on the positive aspects of oneself, okay? We need to own that again because a lot of times, especially with love and sex addictions, we have mm, 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 shooted all over ourselves, as I like to say, for so long that we don't even recognize where we're good anymore. Where we're good. Good people, okay? Who or what is your core self? Do you recognize your own moral compass? The whole theory of role theory is sort of based on the belief, do you believe you have a core self? And who is she or him or it? And what does that core self believe, all right? then. Do you have different roles that you place on top of that core self that draw you away from what you actually believe? You all know in this room when you are doing something that feels like, I shouldn't be doing this, right? Have you ever had that thought or that feeling? <laughs> no. Angels, you're all angels, right? So um, we're gonna talk about that a lot more in depth. Um, Finding resolve and unresolved issues help clients to let go of what's rooting them in their past impulsive behaviors. So that's a lot with psychodrama, reliving unresolved moments, reversing roles, getting to do the ideal experience. Um, putting words and movement to personal preferences. This is gonna be the spectrogram that we're going to do. That keeps them rooted in their state of mind right now, keeps them in, out of the past shame or out of future tripping. Okay? I have so many clients like, well, what do I do in two weeks when I leave and I'm not well yet and I don't know what job I'm going to have and <laughs> future trip, future trip. Okay, so when we're that anxious, let's talk about right now for these next five minutes. What word are you going to choose between these two words? That's the spectrogram that we're going to get to. Um, sculptures. Putting the emotions in the body allows for more sense of control and understanding and showing a family member how they feel. The reason I say family member is because I work... Um, with uh, their love and sex addicts and their families in family intensive workshops. And the sculptures actually happen to be one of the most um, effective techniques because the <coughs> client isn't just saying, I feel sad. My sadness feels like this, okay? So what, is the, what else does that look like to you? The family member can say, that doesn't just look like sadness, that looks like fear, that looks like shame, that looks like you feel so alone, yeah. Good point, I feel all those things. Thank you for saying that. Fake it till you make it, that's what we were saying with the Ross aesthetics. Uh, freedom of expression uh, through a popular medium, that's the hip hop therapy. The disidentification process. Anybody heard disidentification process? What do you, what is that? Um, it's disidentifying from the feeling, so from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So if I'm depressed and sad because this happened, <coughs> it's coming to a place of I have sadness, yes. and not am this, Very good. not mm. sadness. Perfection, thank you, yes. So more importantly, the way we're doing it with this, is we're disidentifying from the role of addict. Mm -hmm. I am not just an addict, I happen to have an addiction, I am in relationship to my addiction in the same way I would be in relationship to somebody that's uh, not a good fit for me, all right? So then, if we're in relationship, we also have the ability to break up with that thing. We don't have to have surgery to remove it, right? Okay. Am I, are you guys with me so far? Everybody okay? It's hot in here, huh? Yeah. Woo! All right, tropical vacation, same time. <laughs> All right, what's the common theme seen amongst clients suffering from love and sex addictions? Shame usually covered up by anger and unresolved issues, yes? Okay, so a lot of the issues that I see are just not knowing what self-care is, having no idea what self-love is, or self-worth. What does it mean to have all of those things? And sometimes we've got to go back and talk to our younger self in order to figure that out. What does that little kid in me need? Maybe a hug, maybe telling me I'm beautiful, maybe saying you're better than that, whatever it is, okay? Needing to hear I'm sorry, needing to hear I love you, needing to say goodbye, needing to hear you're forgiven, needing to hear I respect you still. Oh, that one is so huge. I respect you still, especially with these clients. They have no respect for themselves anymore. Their family, out the window, okay? So hearing from a wife, 
from a husband that has had an addiction like this. I respect you still. I respect you as a man and as my husband. It can be one of the most repairing experiences for him or for her, whatever. Um, this is my boundary. Wow, does anybody have a hard time setting boundaries in here? <laughs> Maybe, personally, or with, you know, with your clients, teaching them how to set a boundary. That's a lot of um, psychodramas that I do when I have them think about future conversations. It's 99% of the time, this is my boundary conversation. I love you, mother-in-law, and no, I cannot go to lunch with you every single day and tell you about my sex problems with my husband. <laughs> I love you, daughter, but no, I can't hear about all of the times you go out and do X, Y, and Z in the middle of the night because I'm just going to freak out, okay? These are my boundaries. Please respect them. Lastly, uh, needing to say, please forgive me. It's very different than I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Sounds very different, right? So needing to say that actually to yourself. Please forgive me. Forgive myself. And then asking it of your family members or your friends around you. Okay, here we go with our first drama therapy technique. So this is role theory, role card um, exercise and assessment tool. So I don't know how clearly you can see these, but they're on your slides there. So role theory is based off of the concept that we all play a series of roles in our lives. All right? So we're sitting here at one time being more than one thing. So for example, as I'm standing here, I'm being teacher. I'm also here as a daughter. That doesn't go away just because I'm up here. Um, I'm here as a lover. I'm here as a friend. I'm here as hmm, what I hope to be a wise person. I don't know, it's debatable, right? So at this moment when I did this one, as an example, I felt like a dreamer, a witness, a sinner, a confused person, a friend, a child, a critic, a beast, and an adult. That's what I felt like I was sitting in at the time. Um, what I didn't feel like was a lost one, an angry person, a victim, an outcast, a hero, a villain, and an innocent. What I wanted to be at the time when I did this was a lover, a person of faith, beauty, helper, rebel, healer, wise person, and survivor. Now there's about 24 roles here, give or take, and all of those come from Robert Landy's original role repertoire. I didn't make these up. But the cool thing about this is that if you wanted to personalize this to your client, you can have your client say, you write out all your 24 roles if you want to, or your 100 roles, whatever it is you think it is. Or you can, have, you can write out a list of um, iconic people in the movies. Um, I am a Marilyn Monroe. I am a James Dean. I, am a, I love Lucy. I am a whatever it is, okay? So these are different characters that you can relate to, right? So what we're looking for here is <clears throat> do these roles fit in with what you believe your core self to be? Are any of these pulling you away from that? All right, so looking at this, uh, yeah, I don't like being a critic. That pulls me away from what I believe my core self is at that day, on that moment, in the five minutes that I did this. When we're having our clients do this, what we're trying to do is assess to see how well balanced our client is. Now, we're not giving them definitions of these words. It's their definitions. But if you look at their eye in this category, and it's full of confused person, lost one, angry, victim, outcast, um, beast, things that we would consider to be more negative roles, we have to ask them, hey, what's going on? How are you looking at yourself today? Why are you associating with all of these different roles? Generally, there's a story behind each one. You don't just feel like a witness because you feel like a witness. You've generally experienced being a witness, whatever that is to you. Either I'm a religious witness or I'm sitting in this group and I'm listening to you, so I'm a witness to your story. I witnessed a crime, uh, whatever it is, okay? Um, we typically have a specific memory, as I was just saying, or a story, and that's how we get our clients to talk to us. This is like an intake interview without an intake interview. Tell me a story behind each one of these roles. Which ones do you like? Which ones don't you like? Why does this role make you uncomfortable? How do you feel if you say you identify with victim? Taking it to the next level, I would say, show me victim. Okay, so this is how we take 2D and make it 3D. Show me what victim looks like in your body. Show me what victim looks like in relation to me. If you're the victim, what am I? Perpetrator? Okay, what did the perpetrator do? All right, so you can make it sculpture with the, the therapist. That's how you get involved as well. Then what we do is we break it down into one role within each category. And these are what these different roles mean. So in the I am this category, it becomes what we just call your role. It's the role you identify, bless you, it's the role you identify with the most on a daily basis. So take a look at this list for a second. And pretending this for you, 
Which role would you identify with the most? Dreamer, witness, sinner, confused person, friend, child, critic, beast, adult. Doug, I'm going to pick on you because I know you. Which one do you identify with the most? Depends on the time. Confused person is probably leading right now. Okay. Yeah. So sitting here in this moment right now, you feel like confused today, person. Today, this week. Yeah. Okay. All right. So when somebody says that to me, today or this week, mm -hmm. sometimes that causes a lot of anxiety because they go, well, I don't know what I was for the entire week. I mean, I was once confused and then I was a beast. And <laughs> okay. Right now, sitting right here today, right now, 12:15. Uh, what do you feel? Of those, of the ones on the left list? Yeah, you're pretending you're me for a second. Oh, yeah, friend. <laughs> friend? Great, yeah. yeah. I call you a friend the majority of the time. <laughs> yeah, so Doug feels like he's a friend the majority of the time, okay? Your I am not this becomes your counter role. This one is a little tricky to explain. The counter role is your underbelly. You're saying you're not these, but you are. All of these you are. You just have... 100% of them or 2% of them, and it's just how relatable they are to you in that moment, okay? So generally what this is is, well, crap, I have all of these in me too. I don't want to really own them right now, but the one that I have the worst time with, the one I don't want to own up to is, and then you identify that, and that is your counter role. So, Doug? Villain. Villain, yeah. Makes sense, right? We've all been the villain at some point whether we meant to be or not, we all got placed into that role. That's the interesting thing about these two. It's not just a role because you identify with it. Sometimes somebody places that role on you, yeah? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, <laughs> you've been an awful person today, I don't like you. Well, I didn't mean to be, that wasn't my intent, and they're really mad at you, so they, they put you in the outcast role. And go to the other room, you know? Okay, so we've got, so far we've got friends and we've got villain for Doug. I want to be is your guide. Right? Think of it like your fairy godmother. This is the role that's going to help you get to your ultimate goal. So in this moment with, I, with my clients, I ask them, what is your goal today? It doesn't have to be your goal from when you were five. It doesn't have to be your goal tomorrow. What is your goal today? Is it just, I don't want to pick up a drink? Mm. I don't want to watch porn today? Great. Which one of these is going to help you not do that? Which one do you have to dial up the most to get you to stop doing that behavior or whatever it is. Maybe their ultimate goal is, I want sobriety for the rest of my life. Maybe their ultimate goal is, I want to marry the right person. Okay, it doesn't have to be related to why they're in treatment. It's just a goal for them today. So Doug, what would be the role from this list that would help you get to your ultimate goal? So I have to pick one from your right list. Sorry, just from, okay. yes, for these purposes. Yeah, so for my right list, I want to be this. Wow. I'll say wise person. How is a wise person going to help you get to your goal? Yeah. So you don't have to reveal your goal, but what would it be about wise person that you personally need to tap into that's going to help you? Um, figure out some things that need to be figured out. It's, it's the easiest way of saying it. Is that what wise people do? If I were wiser, I could. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So that's Doug's definitions of everything, right? A wise person is somebody else, maybe somebody that's older, that's experienced a lot of things. Who knows? I don't know. Is that person's definition of it. So how this pe helps people with love and sex addicts, they see which roles are keeping them active in their impulses, in their shame cycles, and when they can identify the stronger roles, they can determine how to call on them more often. All right? I have a hard time with anger personally, so there's a lot of times that I gotta call on that angry person so I know how to tell somebody how I feel. Because I don't like to tell people that I'm angry or angry with them, right? So this little guy gets a lot of use when it comes to me personally. All right, are there any questions here? Yeah, the colors. Is there a reason for the blue and yellow and white? Or something you ran out of cards. I love you. Thank you for saying that. Um, no reason. I ran out of cards. All of my sets. And everybody asks that every time, and I and I think it freaks them out. And I didn't mean to. It was just actually one of those sets that I bought that had the different ones. So they just look like this. So I have about 30 different sets in there that I've made, and I carry them around with me. And it is an amazing assessment tool, you guys. If you don't want to just sit there and say, where were you born? Do this. It's fun, and they don't think they're being analyzed. They think they're playing a game, which they are, kind of. All right. Any questions on this, guys? Doing okay? All right. Moving right along. 
here's what comes next. Here's the step two, and this is where it becomes drama therapy, taking the two-dimensional to the three-dimensional and putting it into action. So what we're going to do next is we're going to tell a story, all right? So taking the three roles that you just narrowed down with your client, so we've got friend and villain and wise person, Doug would start a story based off of those three characters. And he's not going to write down his own story, though. He's going to pick somebody else in the group, or he's going to use me as the therapist, to be his scribe. This is incredibly important. This is probably the most important part of this exercise. Client never touches their own story. They think about it and it's free association and somebody else writes it down for them, all right? And that other person, whether it's me or another client, writes down every word, every um, every o, oh, every I don't know, everything, okay? It gives you the answers here of why we think we do that, but don't look. Why do you think we do that? Why do you think we have a scribe write it down? Just tell me some answers off the top of your head. Yeah. Because it's uh, the different processes, the analytical process of writing is different to the process of kind of um, storytelling. Fantastic. Yes, exactly. That's one reason. Why else would it be beneficial? Well, we edit ourselves when we're writing. Perfect. Yes. Cross it out. Oh, I should have put an exclamation point. Right? Yeah, we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. We don't understand our own communication skills. Right. Ooh, good point. Yeah. So when we realize, oh, that person doesn't understand what I'm saying, <coughs> let me go slower or whatever it is, right? We are witnessed in a different way. So that's, that's the part of it. Everything that you said was correct. So when somebody else writes it down, it also gives the client the feeling of, wow, that person's really listening to me. Have you ever had to write down every word that somebody said? Doesn't your body language change? <laughs> yes, well, can you say that again, right? Now, as a client, you just become very aware. You slow down. You let yourself really think. You're not self-editing. Very, very important. So we're witnessing and we're honoring that person and their story. That's very, very important, okay? The question always comes up for my clients. Does it need to be true? <laughs> no, it doesn't. But write me a story that isn't true. I dare you to write me a story that doesn't become autobiographical. I dare you, right? You can, be, you can tell me that you're a transformer, and you're going to say, that's not me. And I'm going to say, oh, really? Do you want me to tell you how you're like a transformer? Why don't you tell me how you're like a transformer, OK? So <laughs> no, it doesn't need to be true. And yes, it always ends up that way. The client then listens to his story as it's read aloud by the scribe. The client also never reads their own story. It's said out loud by the person that wrote it for them. Why is that important? What do you think? If they come to something in the, uh, in the transcribed material that they don't like, they'll either gloss over or change it exactly. to, to what fits their moment. Exactly. Or they may be thinking, oh, wait, I didn't say it that way. And they can totally get pulled back to that, right? Your scribe is going to make mistakes. It's OK. I'll also say there's something so powerful in dealing with shame of hearing somebody in a positive way, mirror you perfectly. It's so powerful. Exactly, yes. It does and not happen in daily <laughs> Right, very good, thank you. Yeah. Just to increase the awareness, like, yeah, just like another. not even like, what are, you, are you listening to what you say? Exactly, just another sensory level added on top of that, right? So when we have somebody else say it too, they may have a different inflection than how we said it originally. So maybe a line that says, I hate your guts, when you said it the first time, becomes, I hate your guts. Right? OK, very different experience. And then maybe that client goes, oh, that is how I feel. There's a lot of sadness <laughs> behind I hate your guts. Not so much anger when I said it out loud the first time. OK? Uh, witnesses then, the group, uh, if it's in a group setting, then talk about the stories and the characters. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot a point. Um, after the scribe reads it out loud, then finally the client puts a title on it. So they heard their story out loud, and then they go, my journey into hell. That's the title. OK, great. My journey into hell. Then the witnesses talk about the story and the characters, which creates another safe distance. And the client feels less intimidated or scrutinized. When I say, I heard in that story that the friend decided that they didn't want to be friends with George anymore, that made me feel x, y, and z. Well, we know that's about the client. But we're talking about friends and other people, and so there's some space there that makes the client feel more comfortable. Okay. Uh, next, we act it out. Yay, that's the best part. 
So when we're in a group, the client then gets to cast other people in the group to act out their story. It can be as simple as, I'm going to cast you to be a rock, and you're going to be a tree, and you're going to be George, and you're going to be the dreamer, okay, whatever it is. They can use you as props, they can use you as uh, set pieces, um, they can cast somebody to be the director, they can cast somebody to be a narrator, they can be completely hands off from this if they want it to be. Here's my story, you guys do it. All right, that's for people that are just so overwhelmed that it's still going to be beneficial for them to see their story. For those that are like, yeah, we're going to go, let's do this. Their director, their narrator, they're their main part. They want to play everything. It's like a one-man show. Okay, that means something too, and we let them do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, the, um, if it's a one-on-one -on -one session, the client can act it out with toys or props. Okay, so all the little toys, um, props, things that I have for sand play, I can't play all the parts all at once because um, I have to witness and analyze them at the same time, but they can do it on a smaller scale. Okay, once upon a time there was a dreamer. Here's my little dreamer and they do X, Y, Z. Finally, if it's a group, the group processes their experiences of the story, usually focusing on positive feedback for what they witnessed, and then they can make it personal about how they relate to it, all right? It's very important that the feedback is positive because just like any other creation, it's very, very vulnerable to put a creation up there and then have somebody say, well, I thought that was crap. Okay, well, you can relate to the story and say that made me feel sad, but we're not there to say that was the worst production of Peter Pan I've ever seen. All right, we're not criticizing them as artists. Any questions there? Whew, lots of information. Okay, here we go. Poetry in motion. <coughs> um, all right, you guys, so we're going to do this one together. So if you guys can take out your papers, it has something to write on, you're just going to be answering a very uh, small section of questions right here. Do you need a pen? There's one right there. Um, oh, you need a handout. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, they might have them out there. They should have them out there. Okay, Poetry in Motion. This is called Poetry in Motion because we are focusing on very specific um, bodily experiences. The reason we do this is because um, for some people that are experiencing a lot of anxiety in the moment, I try to have them think about a moment from their past or a moment uh, that they want to have in their future and I have them think about it in detail <coughs> to take them out of the anxiety that they're feeling right there and to take them bodily back to an experience they already had. Um, now, it depends on what's happening for that client. If that client is having a lot of anxiety in the moment, I'm not going to take them back to the first day they came to treatment. <coughs> no problem, I'm not going to do that. But I will take them back to a happy memory, okay? And I'll have them think about that. And that's what I'm going to have you guys think about right now. So I want you to think about and try to relive in your brain as much as you can a very happy memory, something that happened to you. It can be very small, very large, a moment in time that's a very happy memory. If my client goes, I have no happy memories, oh boy, <laughs> that says something, doesn't it? Okay, we address that as it is. But for the most part, everybody's able to come up with some version of happiness in that moment. Does everybody here have a happy memory to work with? Okay, think of the happiest things. All right, body parts. So what I'm gonna <coughs> ask you to do is I want you to think about the body part that stands out the most when you think about that memory. And you're going to tell me what it's doing. Stomach is squirmy, cheeks are aching from smiling, my shoulders are tense, my feet hurt from being in the high heels, um, I feel my dress around my waist, it's cinched in. So a body part and what it's doing, kind of how it feels. All right, what stands out for you? My head is pounding. My muscles are aching. Next, you're going to answer your clothing or appearance that day. Okay, clothing, you can be as specific as you want. You can, I was in heels and a skirt and a blah, blah, blah. If you're talking about appearance, you can kind of be a little more metaphorical. Like, I looked like hell that day. <laughs> it wasn't my best moment. Uh, or you can just focus on one body part like I did. Lips all shiny. Next. We're talking about a sensory image. So any of your senses, I hear, I taste, I smell, I see, I touch. What do you remember from that moment? I hear the seagulls screaming down the beach. I hear the wind rustling through the trees. I hear my child's laughter. 
I hear my husband typing in the other room. I hear a dog barking. Okay. In that memory, what mood are you in? You don't necessarily have to be happy in your happy memory. Were you in a bad mood that day? Were you feeling anxious still, even in that happy moment? You can be two things. I'm anxious and hopeful. It's your mood. Go back to your mood that day. In this happy memory, what are you anticipating? I can't wait to see his face when I get down the aisle. I can't wait to feel her arms around me. I can't wait to get off this plane. I can't wait to taste that In-N-Out burger. Uh, that's mine right now. <laughs> <laughs> Next, this is different. You're answering, what do you hope will happen? I hope this moment never ends. I hope they feel the same. I hope I didn't overwhelm that person. I hope they like my butt in these jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, how will you get where you're going? You can take this literally or figuratively. I'm going to get in the bus and they're going to drive me there. Or you can take it figuratively and you can say, I'm going to take it a day at a time. I'm going to believe that he loves me. I'm going to forgive that person when they ask. All right, so take a look at this one up here, which is one that I wrote when I was in school, and take a look at my answers, and just by looking at that, what do you imagine I'm describing? Stomach is squirmy, lips all shiny, I hear my heels on the pavement, feet on the pavement, I'm anxious and hopeful, I can't wait to see him, to feel his arms around me, oh feet, quicken your pace. Going to a date. Mm -hmm. First date. Exactly. What makes you think that? Uh... I mean, yeah, the kind of nerves and anxiousness and excitement about seeing him and, yeah, arms around me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what else? I thought you were uh, picking him up at the airport. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. could be. Yeah. Now, did all of you think that this was a lover or a love interest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. What if I said uh, this is about seeing my dad coming home from war? That would fit. Why would that fit? Still, it's his arm Yeah, doesn't anticipation. Yeah, doesn't really matter. I think what happens lips is all shiny, yeah. lips all shiny. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. A bit loverish, you know. Right, yeah. but yeah. why? From did I say from lip gloss? What if maybe it's from my tears? Um, so we're waiting for the client to interpret what that means, right? Because sure, this feels like a first date, and you're right because it was because I was that's how I was talking about it. I could read it differently though too. My inflection could change, and it could become my dad coming home. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the various prompts that I use, depending on who my client is, a lot of times to get the um, group to be a little more cohesive, so they know that they've had similar experiences, is I do the first day coming to treatment. What do you guys remember about coming to treatment? Nobody felt good on their first day of treatment, generally. Probably one of the worst physical days of their life, especially if they're going through withdrawals of any type, if they're substance abuse. Okay, so we do that one. Depending on where the client is, I'll have them do a happy memory. If they're stable enough at the moment, I have them do a sad memory. This is where I'm testing if they're distanced or under-distanced or aesthetically distanced, right? If they have the sad memory and they can't get through it without completely breaking down, that means something to me. And then lastly, for people to get them out of a little drudgery, I have them think of a moment in the future, okay? And they are anticipating what they want to have happen. Yeah, I, I got a little lost. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you have the client um, tell you the moment <coughs> that they have described, like we guessed yours? Or? No, no, I don't. I'm generally giving, well, yes and no. I give them the theme, yeah. and then they give me the specifics, and then I have the group say, what does that sound like to you? 
Okay, so oh. yes, the group answers that. Oh, okay. And then I have the client say, oh, no, 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 actually, this is the day that I uh, picked up my dog from the pound. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why not? Sure. <laughs> yeah? And then we go, oh, I felt that way too when I got my puppy for the first time. Or I don't know what it's like to be on a first date. Okay? It's different things like that. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. So as I said before, this helps as a grounding activity to counteract anxiety, depending on which one we're working on. Helping to recall specific memories, perhaps even associated with triggers, both positive and negative, all right? Um, it's a very good just exercise in general for us to be able to think about our memories in detail. How much do we actually recall? When you force yourself to think about it bodily, you remember more, right? Because maybe you're like, oh, the best day of my life was not I was at the beach. Okay, yeah, but did you feel the sand beneath your toes? Did you get sunburned? Do you feel how hot you felt, right? Do you remember what bikini you were wearing? Things like that. Does anybody want to share theirs? I'll share mine. Fantastic, thank you. <clears throat> Heart is expanded, sweats and socks. I hear the rain hitting the pavement. I'm calm and excited to see baby girl's eyes of wonder. I hope she remembers this forever and will watch her with wonder of my own. Mm. Oh, that's so beautiful. What is the feeling that that poem gave you? Nurturing. Nurturing. What does it make you want to do? <laughs> does anybody make anybody else want to do this? Yeah? Okay, so we've got nurturing. It makes me want to do this. What else did you feel? Warm. Warm. Yeah. What else? The love. Beauty. Love, beauty. Tenderness. Tenderness. Even the way she said it was just so calm and even, right? So what were you what do we imagine this she was describing? Daughter. Birth of a child. Birth of a child? Got mention of a baby girl in there, right? Mm hmm Any other guesses? What were you describing? Uh, my niece's first experience of rain. Ooh. Ooh, I gave you chills. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, that's cool because you're experiencing it from you and also maybe trying to imagine what she's feeling at the same time. So you've got two things going on there. All right, very good. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? There's no right or wrong. All right, I'm going to make you share later. You're not getting off the hook. Okay, here we go. All good with this, you guys? I'm just noticing our time. We've got a lot to do. Okay, here's another poem. Uh, this is called the I Come From or the Hero's Journey. This one is uh, simple, <laughs> nothing simple for the client. Simple in that all I'm doing is asking you very specific, what seem to be pretty uh, perfunctory questions and them answering it, all right? The place you were born, favorite breakfast food, a toy you once had as a kid, a game you played as a kid. Now, there are actually 50 five zero questions that I ask them in a session. This is another sort of assessment tool, kind of like an intake that's more creative. Um, so they answer all of these questions. The questions are purposefully laid out in the order that they are because it takes you from childhood to adult to shallow to deep to positive to negative it's making you constantly bounce around in your head so you're not getting stuck anywhere all right going from positive to all these different things so because we go something compliment something mean something beautiful something afraid ding 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 bouncing all around in your head all right so the client answers the 50 questions uh and then they read it out loud yeah are is it is who's writing all the answers. They're writing their own answers, okay. and I'm asking the questions. They don't have a sheet that has the questions okay. because I don't want them to work ahead. As a group, place you were born, write it down. Da -da 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 -da. Do, they, do they know the the like title is I come from? They do. Okay. Mm -hmm. They know that beforehand. What they don't know is that when they're going to say the poems out loud at the end, they're actually going to say the phrase I come from in front of every answer. So they're going to say it for 50 times I come from. Newport Beach, California. I come from Ego Waffles. I come from Buckwheat My Rocking Horse. I come from The Memory Game. I come from You Are So Serene. I come from I Don't Love You. I come from Kindness. I come from Being Alone. I come from I don't know what I hope for. Oh, that's sad. Okay, <laughs> so those are all the different uh, versions of answers, right? No right or wrong answer. They say it out loud. As they're saying it out loud, the other people in the group are listening for themes and patterns that arise. 
always, without fail, there are 50 different questions and somebody will answer these questions with the same word or a same pattern multiple times. If somebody has kids, the word kid or children is going to be in here multiple times. 50 different questions though. Something I love, something I hate. Okay, yep, <laughs> all right. Something I think is beautiful, something I'm afraid of. It can be the same thing, right? Yeah, okay. So they say it out loud, they say I come from, they own every little picadillo and idiosyncrasy in themselves and that's part of it, is owning everything that they are. This is where I come from, good, bad, and different. This is what people hear about me. This is the snapshot of my life. And then I ask them, are you happy with what we're hearing? No. Do you want to change anything? Yeah. Okay. Change it. <laughs> How different would it have been five years ago? Well, five years ago, uh, I wasn't drinking yet. Okay. Different. Okay. Any questions here? Pretty simple, right? This one just sort of a question and answer type of a thing. The performance part comes and then they get to stand up and read their poem out loud and it's kind of like um, slam poetry a little bit. All right, befriending the addiction. This one is one of my favorite ones as well. Has anybody <coughs> ever done this before? Okay, I'm gonna have you guys do this one with me. All right, here we go. So, I want you to think about something that you could work on personally in your life. It doesn't have to be an addiction, but something that you're working on. Uh, maybe it's um, impulses are, are stronger than you control, maybe you've got an anger issue, maybe you don't know how to talk about sadness, maybe you have a problem telling the truth, okay? All those things feel like something. And what you're going to do is you're going to make a character of that thing. You're making a character, like you're drawing it out, like you're describing it, like you had to cast this thing in a movie and you want it to look like this, all right? So first of all, you have to figure out this thing, and I'm saying it's an addiction because I'm generally working with people with the addiction. Would this thing be a man or a woman? When you think about this thing that you're working on, what does it look like, a man or a woman? You can write that down if you want to, if you want to create this character. Next, what would the age and physical appearance of this person be? Is this an old, crotchety man? Is this a seductive woman? Is this a little child? Is this a big athlete? Then I want you to get as detailed as you can. You're actually starting to envision this character. And what is the expression on his or her face? Are they smirking at you? Are they grimacing? Are they growling? Are they confused? Are they staring at you with anger in their eyes? Do they look disappointed? What's the expression on his or her face? I see some of you making faces out there. I love it. <laughs> mm. What kind of clothes does he or she wear? What are his behaviors, voice, and gestures? So you can get as specific as you want here. If it's a seductive woman, is she in an evening gown with a plunging neckline? Can you see all of her curves? Does she have jewelry dripping up and down her arms? Uh, does, she, does she saunter across the room? Is her voice clear like a bell? Is she graceful in the way that she moves? Okay, You're really envisioning this person, this thing, like this person's walking into the room. Oh, that is my problem with, mm-hmm, that's what that looks like. I know, I'm sorry, we have to go quickly, but next, uh, what would his or her name be? Name this guy, name this girl. It doesn't have to be a human name as we know it, like Veronica or Stacy or Jim. It can be a fat bastard. It can be the lonely soul. Whatever it is, you're going to name this character. Okay, now I want you to think about, does he or she seduce you? attack you, trick you, this thing love you into feeling this way? Does it hate you into feeling this way? Does it push you? Does it pull you? This character is interacting with you in some way. What does it do? Does it smack you? Does it caress you? Does it hold you? Next, the way we embody this is I would ask, 
that the client thinks about having a conversation with this addiction or with this thing. So it would allow the addiction to speak, okay? What we're trying to figure out is what does this addiction want from you? What does it want? Try to figure that out. And how would it ask for it? What's it saying? I want you to feel like you're on top of the world. I want you to feel like you can do anything. I want you to feel like the piece of crap that you are. As it talks, what is it saying? And then how do you talk back to it? What do you want to say to it? This right here is what we were talking about before, the disidentification process. I am not my addiction. I am in relationship to it. This, this other thing looks like this. I can talk to it. And I can also say, it's time for it to scram. Kick it out of your life. Okay? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Could the addiction be kind of interchangeably used with someone with depression? Yes. Someone with loneliness? Exactly. Yeah. So befriending your depression, befriending your anxiety, befriending your loneliness, right? So with those, um, it's a lot of um, my loneliness feels like. Um, an old woman, woman in white rags and she's hunched over and it's kind of like what that person makes them feel. That's how they do it a lot of the time. Yeah, good question. Thank you. All right, are you guys clear with this one? Then we could make whole scenes out of this. I mean, we could have them write down what it says and we, they could have other people <coughs> act it out. They can act it out themselves, but there's a zillion other steps that we can do after that. This is just the, the stepping stone, the building block to it. All right, next we have sand play. This is what I was talking about with the kinetic sand. The kinetic sand is basically like wet sand all the time that makes no mess. I don't know if there's any better way to say it. You can mold it and shape it, and if you drop it on the floor, it sticks to itself, so you just take a ball of it and, and uh, pick it up with the, the other sand, which is fantastic. Um, Long story short, this is very simple and kind of like play therapy. This is kind of a, a little bit bigger than a shoe size box. This is my ball of kinetic sand, fills up about half of it. Um, what I ask is for the client to create their world out of the sand, okay? So maybe they have a lot of dips and valleys, maybe they make a whole bunch of mountains, maybe they have many peaks in there, maybe their world is one big ball, maybe they take all the sand and take it out of the box. It's their world. They're, I'm, not, I'm not asking them to do anything with it yet except to show me their world. Then I have them choose one item that represents themselves. So they're going to choose a toy that they think best represents themselves in that moment for whatever reason. I look like that toy. I relate to that toy. That toy makes me feel. And they put that toy where they feel they are in their world. All right? So that's me in the middle there, this character. And uh, she's in the center of her world. <laughs> I'm always in the center of my world. Uh, she's in the center of her world, okay? If my client took that character and put them out here where this one is, that would be interesting. Okay, you're totally separated from your world. I'm not there to ask them about it yet. These are just the things that I'm thinking about. Then I have the client choose nine more items. The nine more items represent people, places, emotions, concepts, things that are important to them. Um, and as they're choosing, they say, this represents my career. This represents my husband. These snakes represent my anxiety. That's one of the snakes, okay? They just say what it represents, and then we go back and we talk about each one of them. How close are they to you? How far are they from you? Are they where you want them to be? Your career looks pretty big and overbearing. Are you stressed out at work? Yep, okay, that makes sense. All right, so you, they show you their world. Once again, just kind of a cool distancing technique so you can see it in front of yourselves. And then you have them totally do a blank slate, and then you have them create their ideal world. Okay? Then you ask them, is it the same characters? Are there different characters? If you had to break it down, you could only have three items left in addition to you. What would you keep? The concept of love, the concept of sobriety, the concept of my family. I would flush everybody out and it would just be me. What's your ideal world in that moment? Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Pretty simple, right? It's just another like, there's my world. I have control. That feels good. Okay. All right, spectrogram. You can choose a word, how you associate with it today. That's it, very simple. Raise your hand if you associate with black today versus white. Black, raise your hand if you associate with black. <laughs> black, raise your hand if you associate with white. Okay, raise your hand today if you associate with vanilla. Raise your hand if you associate with chocolate. Night, day. 
with all of these, um, while my clients are, what actually happens, they're not just sitting. I actually physically move them from one side of the room to the other side. So say, black is over here, white is over there. Go. Zing. Split second, they have to go. So many of my clients say, well, I'm in the middle. I like gray. Okay, great. Black or white? There is no middle today. You have to choose. I want a swirly cone. No, you can only have vanilla or chocolate. You're getting over it, all right? As you can see, the list goes on and on. We have some that are um, a little deeper. Empathy, sympathy. As we get closer over to the end here, sober, drunk. Where are you today? In love, out of love. Addicted, not addicted, okay? And they have to choose, and then they put words to it. The whole point behind this is uh, sharing clients' associations, also, again, looking for themes, and helping them to feel the power of making a decision. Wow, so many clients, right? It's hard. Um, I don't like to sit just in vanilla, because I actually like chocolate, too. It's just for right now. Relax. It's okay. Vanilla for now. All right, fine. Now, um, great icebreaker activity, too, if you're having a group for the very first time, just to see where people's allegiances lie. And some people get really fired up, right? <laughs> we talk about mountains and beach, and they're just arguing. I hate the beach. How could you love the beach? Mountains are better. Okay. And then it gets them talking to each other, which is fantastic. All right. So that is an example of spectrogram. All right. Family intensives. So I will quickly go through all of this because I see we're running out of time. Um, family intensive workshops. As I said, I had uh, the privilege of working with my clients and their families. It's um, in um, Promises Treatment Center up in Malibu. It's really cool because um, I see the clients for a couple of months at a time, and then I finally see their families and all these people they've been talking about. And it's like, oh, yeah. Or no. <laughs> it's like, oh, I see you. Like, <laughs> all right. Or, oh, you're lovely. You're not at all like they described. I never say that, but that's what I'm thinking. All right. So I have three hours with this group when I do this psychodrama group with them. And the whole point of it is to get to a psychodrama, okay? For all of you that know about psychodrama, it's absolutely exhausting and very, very raw, and so there's a lot of build-up to it. There is no way on this earth that I would say, hi, everybody, nice to meet you. Anybody have an unresolved moment they want to work through? No? Because I generally get these looks. <laughs> no? Not happening. Okay, so this is how we warm everybody up, all right? So I say, we're going to form a circle. Everybody up off your feet. I get them up immediately. We're forming a circle. I generally have about 30 people. So we form the group, uh, the, the circle, and I say, okay, in the middle of the circle, we are imagining the mall of emotions. Anything you could ever need, anything you could ever want, anything you could ever buy is right there in the center, okay? Each person, one at a time, gets to go in, and they get to buy what they think they need to get through the rest of the day. If somebody says, charges into the circle, and says, I need a cup of coffee. Why do you need a cup of coffee? I'm tired. What do you need? A cup of coffee. What do you need, actually? What does the coffee provide? Energy. Where do you need the energy? In my body. All right, put it in your body. So I make them physicalize. Taking that energy, putting it into their body. All right? Some people go a little deeper right from the beginning. I need courage. All right, great. What can you buy that represents courage? Um, a suit of armor. Um, a Bible. Um, a shield. A sword. Okay? So then we start to get really physical with it, right? They're buying all these things. All right, so we do that. That gets people loose enough. They go, oh, and I say, there's no price tag on anything. And they go, really? I'm buying a jet. And I'm like, great. What does the jet actually provide? Freedom. Yes. Okay, great. So we're moving on. All right, next. I ask them to do the same thing, but they're buying a gift for somebody else in the circle. Okay? Preferably not to the family member that they came with. Maybe somebody else. But if they want to do it for their family member, that's fine. The reason why I have them do a gift is because I want them to think about everybody's personal story that they've heard. They've been together now in this group for three days doing intensive work. They've heard each other's story. So I may say to this person, I want to buy you a trip around the world with your family because I know how much you miss them and you need quality time. Do you accept that gift? And that person goes, oh, yeah. Okay, and then it gets them starting to think, oh, I can buy a trip around the world. I could buy a time machine. I can go back in time. I could buy sobriety for life. I can give you feelings of love and joy for the rest of your life. Do you accept those gifts? Yes, it's like, Oprah, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. And everybody feels so good because we're giving gifts. And ultimately what that part is is somebody I don't know listens to my story and what I need. They're going to give that to me. Okay. All right? 
Um, as I just said, the ritual of picking something out for the person and symbolically offering it to them just feels good to begin with. It feels good to give gifts, but also when the person receives the gift, it helps them to feel heard because someone has been listening to the details of their story. Next is our family sculptures, and this is uh, generally where it gets deeper and people start to cry. <laughs> Here's why people start to cry. Okay, so then I say, all right, we are turning this room into a museum. All right, everybody in here is an artist. All of my clients, you are the artists, and your families are your families are pieces of clay. The word that you are going to show me is addiction. Show me what addiction looks like in your family. Okay. The client then takes all the different family members and puts them into the different positions, like they're a piece of clay or a piece of marble. Okay. It can be literally how they know that person to be in their addiction. Like my dad was always on his computer. My mom was constantly worrying on the phone. My sister had her nose over a line of coke too, okay? It can be literally how that person knows them, or it can be my mom always looked like she was about to cry. My dad always looked like he was about to beat me, okay? He puts, the client puts them into all of these different sculptures, sculptures, excuse me, and how they relate, yeah. Which client, because the whole family's there, is it the one in treatment? Yes, the one in treatment, the original client. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then the client inserts themselves into the sculpture as well. Okay, that's the very last piece. So it sculpts everybody else, then he inserts himself in, and we've got the final piece. Everybody takes a moment um, and then goes to the center of the circle one at a time, and the rest of the group talks about what they see, almost like they're just they're looking at a piece of art. Not trying to interpret a story, just what they see. Okay? So if I get myself into this position over here, what do you see? Terror. Terror. What else? Frozen. Frozen. What else? Alone. Alone. Shame. Shame. What else? Protection. Protection. Okay? So that says a lot just by getting into that. It could be a zillion things. And this is what the, the witnesses, the audience are saying that they see. From that position, I can go, yeah, yeah, that's what I feel. Okay, look at the next person. What do you see? If it's this motion, what do you see? Wanting, what else? Begging. Begging, what else? Frustration. Frustration, what else? Holding. Holding, what else? Tension. Waiting. Tension, waiting. Okay, Tension. where is the energy going? Which direction? Oh, this way, right? Protection. Like a, yeah, protection, yeah. yeah Different if I'm like yeah. this, which way is the energy going? Towards you. Backwards, right? Okay, so this is going to be in relation to all of these other people, and this is what we're seeing. Then the people that are in the sculpture get to go, yes, that's exactly how I'm feeling, all right? If somebody's in this position, then I may ask that family member or that client, what do you want to say from this position? And generally they break and go, well, I want to say that I was really reaching out for that person. No, no, no. What do you want to say like it's a line in a movie, okay? Please, let me help you. I need you, okay? We're looking for the line, the thing. What does this say? Ah, I'm so tired. Weird. Okay, whatever it is, or generally something that they need to say. Then they all can have a line, they talk about it. Um, right here, when they generally speak what it is that they need, if it's like, I miss you, okay, that's where we get the tears. Because this is basically the scene that they're wanting, right? That's the warm up for the psychodrama. What do you need to say? What do you need to hear? Okay, then we already know how we could reverse roles. Then we just put the unresolved moment on top of it. You walked out the door. 10 days ago, and I haven't gotten to talk to you since. That's how I was left. And you were like this. Okay? So then we go back to that, if that's the unresolved moment. Okay? I have a question. Yeah. What do the family members see it differently? That's a good point. That's why I always say, this is through the eyes of the client, otherwise we'd be there forever. Okay. And sometimes <laughs> I might have them switch. Okay, let's do it through mom's eyes. Let's okay. do it through dad's eyes. Okay. But typically, they all have a similar, they get it right the first time. Okay. It's like, yeah, well, you know what? I was on my computer the whole time. Well, I was trying to ignore the problem. All right, yeah, that's right. Okay, so they see okay. their side of it too. All right. Um, so you can position, fantastic. All right, and then we go into psychodrama. Good <laughs> Lord, this is a whole other, uh, whole other thing. Why? Which is why I was prepared. <laughs> In that, after all of this information that's on your sheet, you have a separate handout 
that has detailed psychodrama information that takes you through an entire psychodrama session. How you choose the protagonist, where psychodrama comes from, what it means to reverse roles, how you do role training, um, what the double is. Okay, there's a whole other training that I could do just on psychodrama, but it's very, very detailed. There's also a case study in there that's called The Dance. Um, it's one of the clients that I had. You can see how psychodrama is effective even if you don't put words to it. Okay? Um, let's see if there's. That's me. <laughs> Call me if you need me. If you have any other questions, seriously, we just went through so much information, please feel free to give me a call. You can text me. You can visit my website, um, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions for you. Um, do you have any questions currently? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. My pleasure.